Hello and welcome to another Bible in the News. We live in an epic time period. It seems that world events are heating up with more and more happening on the world stage, which is relevant to the prophecies we read of in our Bibles. This is Matt Davies joining you for another Bible in the News. I hope you're well. Bible students have long been awaiting a Russian-led multinational invasion south into Turkey and then beyond down into Israel. You see Daniel 11. The invading army will consist of the Russians and nations from Europe, northern Africa and also the Middle East. See Ezekiel 38. This force will sweep down and head for Egypt, as we read of in Daniel 11 verses 42 to 43 and Isaiah chapter 19. Then it will turn about and attack Israel, as in Daniel 11 verse 45 and Zechariah 14 verses 1 and 2. And this event will bring about the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven, who will defend the Jews and defeat the attackers with his immortalised saints. Zechariah 14 verse 4 and 5 and Acts 1 verse 11. The Lord Jesus Christ will then re-establish the throne of his father David in Jerusalem and reintroduce the kingdom of God on the earth. Luke 1 verse 32 to 33, Ezekiel 21 verse 27 and 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. The nations will be required to submit to him as king of king and lords of lords and a time of peace and tranquility like no other will be seen on the earth. 1 Timothy 6 verse 14 to 16 and Psalm 72. Now we live in the momentous times leading up to this epic event. We know we are living in the time period leading up to these events because the Bible specifically speaks of a momentous prophetic event which is to take place just before these things unfold. That event has passed. It is the regathering of the people of Israel back into their land. This is required by the prophecies in order for the rest of the prophetic story to unfold. For example, in Ezekiel 38 verse 8, we read of how the invasion comes against the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. A place, we read, which have, has always been waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations in Ezekiel 38 verse 8. We have seen the re-establishment of the nation of Israel since 1948, and we are living in the days preceding the next phase of the prophecies. So when we look around us at the political landscape of the nations today, we look for indications of how God might cause this great event to take place. Many signs abound. Although we are unsure exactly of the precise detail of every step in the development of things, we have been given, in God's prophetic word, indications of what will happen, and we have been given an even clearer vision of the end picture of the destiny of the nations and the return of Christ to the earth. In the last few months, a wave of activity has been seen in a way perhaps we might not have guessed even a year or so ago. The Islamic group ISIS are hitting the news in all the key hotspots we might expect from a Bible prophecy perspective. Consider the following three examples. Example number one, ISIS in Turkey. One of the new developments in the last week has been Turkey's U-turn in regards to its position on engaging with ISIS in Syria. On Monday the 20th of July, a terrorist suicide bomb exploded in the Turkish town of Suruk near the Syrian border. It killed over 30 people, wounding uh, uh, nearly 100 more. In a Guardian article published on Saturday the 25th of July, the following was reported, quote, In a major tactical shift this week, Turkey decided to take a more active role in the US-led coalition fighting against ISIS, agreeing to open its air bases to allied forces, as well as carrying out its own air raids. It is the first time Turkish fighter jets have entered Syrian airspace to attack ISIS militants on Syrian soil. 
Previous air raids were conducted from the Turkish side of the border, according to the Turkish government. In another article by the Mail Online, the following was reported. Senior ISIS commander among those arrested as Turkey raids hundreds of addresses in Istanbul and carries out its first airstrikes on terror targets in Syria. Suspected ISIS fighters raided in Istanbul as Turkey finally acts on jihadis. News comes as Turkey bombed ISIS positions inside Syria for the first time. Three Turkish warplanes dropped bombs on three ISIS targets overnight. Just hours earlier, the first major cross-border clashes between Turkey and ISIS took place, leaving one soldier and one militant dead, end quote. Turkey, then, have been sucked into the conflict with ISIS. The second example I'd like to point out is ISIS in Egypt. In a recent Debka file, the following was reported on the 23rd of July. Quote, Islamic State affiliates in Sinai and Libya have banded together with the Palestinian Hamas rulers of the Gaza Strip for the shared goals of capturing northern Sinai from the Egyptian army. End quote. ISIS have stepped up its attack in Egypt in recent weeks. Time magazine had an article on on July the 23rd entitled Egypt is struggling to cope with its ISIS insurgency. It reported, quote, the surge in violence began in late June when Egypt's chief prosecutor was killed in a car bombing in daylight in an upscale Cairo neighborhood. Two days later, the ISIS affiliated militants launched a massive assault on military positions in North Sinai, attempting to seize control of a small chunk of territory in Egypt. At least 17 Egyptian soldiers died, although some reports placed the death toll much higher. The attacks did not stop there. Early on the morning of July 11, a bomb destroyed part of the Italian consulate in Cairo. Another attack targeted soldiers on the Suez Road. Later, Williat Sinai published photos of a missile hitting an Egyptian navy ship in the Mediterranean. The Egyptian military said no one died, while the insurgents claimed they killed the whole crew. End quote. The third example I'd like to point out is ISIS in Russia. Russia are looking south at the events which are unfolding and have realised that they too may become subject to the Islamic State attacks. Rumour has it that there is an ISIS branch operating close to Russian soil, if not in it, in the North Caucasus, in the region of Chechnya. In a recent news article in the Daily Beast entitled, quote, ISIS comes to Russia, end quote, the following was reported, quote, At the same time that bombs rain down on the Islamic State and it grapples with tactical setbacks in Syria and solidifying its hold in Iraq, ISIS continues to expand its brand, this time in the Caucasus. In June, one of the most important and respected rebels in the North Caucasus pledged loyalty to ISIS. The defection of Amir Kamzat, commander of the Chechnese, Chechnyan Vilyat, the Vilyat is a territorial administrative unit that roughly correspond with the regional republics, represents a large gain to the standing of ISIS and its expansion into Russia. A statement posted to Twitter on June 21 read, We testify that all Mahajadeen of the Caucasus in the Vilayets of Chechnya, Dagestan, Galkaloko and KPK are united in their decision and we do not have differences among ourselves. This statement led ISIS on June the 23rd to embrace the pledges of loyalty and declared the creation of a new Vilayet under the control of Digistani Amir Rumstam Alisadov. End quote. Moscow is keeping an eye on things on its southern border. After the nuclear deal reported on in last week's Bible in the News, The Guardian published an article entitled Russia Says Iran Deal paves way for broad coalition against ISIS. The article says, quote, 
The Iran nuclear deal has paved the way for a broad coalition to fight the Islamic State group, according to the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. It removes the barriers, largely artificial, on the way to a broad coalition to fight the Islamic State and other terrorist groups, Lavrov said in a statement on the ministry's website on Tuesday. The normalisation of the situation with Iran makes it possible to resolve a whole number of problems and conflicts in the region and will have a positive influence on the situation as a whole, Lavrov said. In particular, it creates added impetus to improve the creation in the Middle East of a zone free of weapons of mass destruction. The European Union foreign policy chief, Federica Magarini, told Sky Italia earlier on Tuesday that the deal opens the way for a new confidence in combating ISIS. For Bible students, this is all very interesting. We see a Russia, the people of Rosh, of Ezekiel 38 verse 2, now looking to unite nations against a common enemy, that of ISIS. Iran is the modern name for Persia, and this is one of the key nations listed as being part of the multinational invading force in Ezekiel 38 verse 5. We see ISIS operating in those key areas. Egypt is a key location because we know from Daniel 11 and Isaiah 19 that this area will be a target to be controlled by the northern invader as part of the events which precede the open intervention of God in human affairs through the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turkey is a key location. In Daniel 11, we read at the start of the chapter how that after the mighty king of Alexander the Great, the Greek Empire would split into four. The prophecy picks up on two of the four divisions, one to the north of Israel, called the king of the north, and one to the south, called the king of the south. It explains in broad terms how these two power bases would war against each other down through time. The first king of the north was Seleucus, one of, the, one of Alexander the Great's four generals. He governed the ancient territory known as the Seleucid Empire. This covered the area of Turkey, Iran, Syria and Pakistan. The other area discussed is the area to the south of Israel called the King of the South, or the Ptolemaic Empire, which contained Egypt. The prophecy goes through various events which would happen down through time between the occupiers of these territories. In verse 36, though, another character is introduced in addition to the king of the north and the king of the south. He is simply known as the king. And as you follow the prophecy through, you will find that this describes the rulership of the two territories when one occupying power has control of them both. This is the time when the Roman Empire controlled the north and the south. And so there was no king of the north and king of the south. There was just the king. The capital of the Roman Empire at this point was Constantinople. So it's logical to conclude that the king is the power in Constantinople. In verse 40 we read, And the king of the north shall come against him, the king of Constantinople, like a whirlwind. Here then, God has revealed that an occupying power which controls all the territories of the king of the north will come against the territory of Constantinople or Istanbul. If things escalated and ISIS did happen to gain ground in Turkey, could this prophecy begin to be fulfilled with a Russian invasion south to take out the ISIS threat to Russia? The prophecy goes on though, the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown but these shall escape out of his hand even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So we're being told here that the northern invader comes against Egypt. Could we see a northern confederacy supported by Europe coming down to finish its war with ISIS 
in Turkey. We then read of how he comes back from Egypt into Israel, but meets his end in Jerusalem in verse 45. Other prophecies, such as Zechariah 14, fill in further details here of how this is when Christ and the saints are revealed on the world scene. So is there any other prophecies which might link to the idea that Isis might be the reason the northern invader is drawn south as the prophecies demand? There is an indication in Numbers chapter 24 and the prophecies of Balaam. Amongst the things Balaam speaks of is a set of prophecies about the surrounding nations of Israel which connect with the same time period we have looked at in Ezekiel 38, known as the latter days. In chapter 24, verse 14, we read, Now, behold, I, Balaam, go unto my people. Come, therefore, and I will advertise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. In verses 23 to 24, Balaam utters a very enigmatic prophecy. Alas, who shall live when God doeth this? And ships shall come from the coast of Kittim, and shall afflict Ashur, and shall afflict Eber, and he also shall perish for ever. Kittim is an ancient name for Cyprus. Eber was the ancestor of the race of the Hebrews, Israel. Ashur is another name for Assyria. Ashur is also an actual city located 110 kilometres south of Mosul and 280 kilometres north of Baghdad. Here then we can see another prophecy which speaks of an invading force coming with ships against the Jews. And we've already read of how the king of the north uses ships in Daniel chapter 11. Now, in the same time period, we see they come from Cyprus and it's interesting that Russia has just done a deal with Cyprus to use their naval bases. However, note what the prophecy is saying. The ships will come and afflict Assyria or Ashur as well as Eber or Israel, the Jews. The ancient Assyrians held the territory between the Tigris and the Euphrates, the exact same territory that Isis is in control of today. So perhaps here in Numbers is an indication of the reason that the northern invader comes down. He comes down to sort out an antagonistic force in the region of Assyria. Linking this with Daniel 11, it does not seem unreasonable to suggest that the same antagonistic force of Isis, which is operating in the other two hotspots of Turkey and Egypt at the moment, could also fit. Instead of coming down against separate powers, as we might have assumed, maybe Russia will invade to clear up one and the same threat to its orthodox ideology. It is indeed certainly interesting that these three prophetic hotspots, which Bible students have pondered for many years, are now all linked with the rising power of ISIS. Now, of course, we cannot be dogmatic on these things. Time will reveal the ultimate path the nations will take before they are in place as the prophets have spoken. As the Proverbs tell us, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honour of kings is to search out a matter, Proverbs 25 verse 2. So we must watch and wait. One thing is for sure though, events in the region are heating up. The nations are moving from crisis to crisis and they will end up just as God has determined. We are living in the last days, just before Christ returns. So the question we must ask ourselves is, are we ready? The Bible speaks of the way of salvation being through belief and baptism into the gospel message. Have we sought out and accepted that message? Are we living lives which illustrate that faith? Do we separate ourselves from the godlessness and the humanist mindset of a world which is soon to pass away? Do we seek to gratify our own lusts or do we put God's ways above our own desires? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Romans 14, verse 10 to 11. 
These are the real issues we need to search out in our own lives. So as we see the day of Christ's return looming, let us follow Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5, which says, Trust in the Lord Yahweh with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. This has been Matt Davies joining you for another Bible in the News. If Christ remains away, come back again next week to www.bibleinthenews.com for further commentary on world events in the light of Bible prophecy. God bless.